Most people like me because of my wife, and I, I'm okay with that. She's pretty awesome. But I'm honored that uh, I got asked to be able to, uh, to share with you guys tonight. I'm double honored that you didn't stand up and walk out when you heard it wasn't going to be Pastor Brian. Uh, many of you probably thought, oh, great, youth guy. What uh, rap song is he going to pull biblical truths out of tonight? Uh, I'm not going to do that. But if you could all turn to uh, Second Pac, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. I had to slip one youth joke in there. I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, I, I showed up tonight, and Pastor Tiffany was like, hey, we gave you 30 minutes. And I'm like, 30 minutes? Holy moly, I, I'm, I'm used to uh, preaching 15 minutes and then hanging out and eating food and drinking Cokes and running around playing dodgeball and stuff. And I've seen a lot of y'all's faces when I said 15 minutes. You probably thought, man, greatest church service ever, 15 minutes. But us charismatics, that's right, us charismatic. 15 minutes, we're like, that's the first worship song. If you know me, if your back's not uh, numb, um, then worship's not over. So I, your legs can't even work. That's when you know to sit down and uh, welcome everybody. But uh, you survived the blizzard. You showed up. Uh, I, I'm, I'm blessed that you're here and, and that I get to share with you. Many of you fasted with us this past week. And if you were crazy enough to go... Uh, shopping while you were fasting, you probably ended up with a lot of food, and you probably asked yourself, Lord, what am I going to do with all this food? And then he made it snow, and you had to get stuck in your house, and you're like, $400 worth of Doritos, what am I going to do with this? And then day one of the uh, blizzard, which Michigan just calls Wednesday, here we call it a blizzard, day one of the, the blizzard, you're already back on click list, and then what's the first thing you pick? Doritos. Yeah. We're creatures of habit. But uh, tonight, I have a message titled, Share Your Miracle, and uh, this message is close to my heart, and I, I, it's actually my favorite message, so uh, I get to give it to you guys tonight. Um, comes out of Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 48, and they're going to put it up on the screen, and I'll read it to you, and I wear glasses. Where are all my glasses, people, at? i got to pick this up. Here we go. On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogues, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could no find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt the healing power go from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time that we get to come into your house and glorify you, Father God. Lord, we thank you for your word, that it's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, and that we can hide your word in our heart that we might not sin against you, Father. Lord, thank you that um, you renew our faith, Father. Just renew our faith tonight. Uh, show us your signs and your wonders. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So a few years ago, uh, it was like Memorial Day or Labor Day, one of, the, one of those holidays that they sneak in there and... Uh, it, it was coming up, and one of this, uh, this pastor that I follow, he writes books, and I, I, I like to read his books. I was looking online, and his book tour was coming to Nashville. So I'm like, man, I, I go to Tabitha at that point. We worked at the same place, and I'm like, Tabitha, look, he, he's, he's bringing his book here. We need to go see it. And she sees that Carrie Job is going, and she's like, oh, Carrie Job's going to be there. Now I'm excited, so let's go. So being the awesome person she is, she's like, hey, we should take our friends because if there's something in life that you should do, you should do it with your friends. So we gather all of our friends, we pack up that morning, we head out early because if you're going to travel, come on, how many people are like this? You travel, you're already picking the places you're going to eat. You're like, whoo, got, yes, got to travel. I'm going to eat somewhere good. So we head to Nashville. We we're already asking around what's the best places to eat. And somebody tells us the pharmacy. And if you've never been to the pharmacy, it is the anointing of hamburger. It is just beautiful. Awesome burger. And 
I go there, we go there, we eat, we wait in line, it's raining outside, we get in, and they have the perfect chili to hamburger ratio. Not too messy, it's just perfect. Yes, we eat, and we go, we get in line because I like to be punctual, I like to get a good seat, I'm a front row guy, I like to be up, catch the sweat, catch the anointing just coming off the stage. So we get there early, we wait in line, and uh, we get like third row from the front. I'm like, this is amazing. So the guy comes out, he preaches his message, and we get an opportunity at the end. They're like, hey, do you want to meet this guy and get your book signed? And I'm like, oh, man, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm kind of, I, I know I'm a youth guy, but I'm aged a little bit. I'm like, it's 10 o'clock. It's a two-hour ride home. I got to work in the morning. Ah. You guys don't judge me over here. Hey, if you're going to preach on the big stage for the first time, bring your own amen corner over here. Uh, let's give the youth a hand clap. So I'm waiting, and I'm like, I don't know what to do. And my wife, being the wise woman that she is, because behind every good man, there is a better woman, she goes, hey, look, I don't care what we do. We can stand here and we can wait. But I don't want to hear you say, I can't believe we didn't wait. We should have waited all the way home. I'm like, all right. So we wait, and then we're standing in the line, and I'm a little nervous. I'm like, man, this is just a dude. You know, why, why, am I, why am I a little nervous? And she goes, being wise that she is, she says, well, he's a man of God, and he has authority on him, and, you know, that's something that we should respect. Come on, we should respect men of God. When they walk in the room, we should stand up when um, we should want to be around him, we should want to get around him. And I was a little nervous because this was a man of God. And we go, I do what I do, I make him laugh, I get, his, I get my picture. And you're probably wondering, what in the world does this have to do with a woman touching Jesus's coat? Uh, it, absolutely nothing, but I got a lot of time to fill. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, in this story, we see these people, it, the Bible says that crowds, multiple crowds, uh, were waiting for Jesus. Jesus was a rabbi, and a rabbi back, th back then, he was a man of authority. If you were called upon to come follow a rabbi, it was an awesome place to be in life. You dropped whatever you were doing, and you followed that rabbi because it was a great position to be. And Jesus shows up, these people love him. And come on, we serve a God who loves to be loved. So these people love Jesus, and they're following Jesus around. They're getting up close to him, and they're getting their selfies with him, and they're all rubbing up against him and everything. And Jesus is like, hey, man, this is awesome, the crowds, because he loves to be loved. He was fully man, fully God. And uh, then this woman, we see this woman, she sneaks in, and she just she touches that one string your grandma told you never to pull. Like, don't pull on that string, the whole thing will come apart. She's like, if I could just, she's got faith the size of a tank. She's like, if I could just touch that one little thread, I will be healed of this thing that I can't get rid of, this burden in my life that I cannot get rid of. If I could just touch it, I would be healed. If I could just touch it, I would be healed, and then I could go about my way. So she sneaks in, she touches the robe, and she's just going to go off and do her own thing. But Jesus says, who touched me? And when you read it in the Bible, it seems like Jesus just politely said, who, t who touched me? But you gotta, you got to give it depth. you got to look into it. There were crowds. There were crowds of people. Unless he was surrounded by crowds of moms, it was probably pretty loud there. So Jesus didn't just quietly ask, who touched me? He probably had to yell, who touched me? And then when the rabbi spoke, people listened. So you could probably have heard a pin drop after he spoke. And if you've got somebody in your life that's like, man, if I could just see Jesus, if I could just see him, this is what I would say to him. When you read the Bible, you see that these people were, in fact, face to face with Jesus. And when he asked who touched me, everybody got the, I don't know. I don't know who touched you. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I've been managing companies for a long time, and I've been looking for this guy named I don't know my whole life. He's just, I'm like, we don't pay him, but he seems to do everything here. So <laughs> this guy, they're like, I don't know. Everybody denies it. The Bible says that everybody denies touching him until finally this one, Peter, <laughs> if 
if there was anybody in the Bible that represented the human race the best, it was Simon Peter. This guy denied Jesus. Come on, we've been there. He hated quiet moments to the point that he would literally say anything all the way to the point that God had to tell him to be quiet when he was on top of the mount during the transfiguration. And then in this point, he was like, you ever had that friend that never had a, never had a thought to themselves? Don't look, at, don't look at your neighbor. They might be your ride home. It's cold out there, but they just couldn't keep a thought to themselves. Everybody's looking at Peter like, don't you say it. Don't you say it. And he's like but everybody's touching you right now. It's like, if they had cell phones, they would have sent him the palm face emoji. Seriously, Peter? Really? That's not what he was saying. But Jesus said, no, someone deliberately touched me. Someone deliberately touched me because I felt the healing power leave my body. Come on, that's the anointing that I want in my life. That when I lay hands on somebody and I pray for somebody, that I feel it leave my body. Jesus, he was so in tune. He knew what was going on that he knew when that woman touched him that that power left, uh, left him. And uh, the Bible says that she couldn't stay hidden anymore. People were probably looking at her like, I know who touched you. She did it. And so she came forward. And you got to know that back then it, with her disease, she probably had to yell unclean, unclean. And she wasn't allowed to touch anybody, let alone a rabbi. So she was probably a little scared because she touched him and she didn't want anybody to know that she was there and that she touched somebody because it was probably a death sentence if somebody would have found out. But uh, she begins, she hits her knees. The Bible says she hits her knees and she begins to explain why she touched him and that she was immediately healed. The Bible says that everybody heard. Everybody listened and everybody heard. Jesus says that your faith has healed you. It wasn't about, Jesus wasn't saying who touched me out of rebuke. Jesus wasn't saying who touched me to scorn somebody or beat somebody. Jesus was saying who touched me out of encouragement because it wasn't about that at all. It was about her sharing her testimony because we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Because there is a renewal in the sharing of our miracle, not only in our own faith, but in the faith of those that are around us. We can all relate to this lady. We can all relate to what she's been through. We go to work burdened by something in life, burdened by pain, burdened by sickness, burdened by uh, depression or anxiety. And we go into our workplaces or our schools or our families. And the first thing that we do is we begin to tell them about the situation in our life. The thing that is wrong in our life. We say, you know, man, I'm really sick or uh, I got this pain in my back. And these people know, the people that are close around us each and every day, they know exactly what we're dealing with in life. And then as faith people, we come into the house of God, the place that King David said he hopes he can dwell all the days of his life. We come in here and then we have pastors led by the Holy Spirit to open up the altar for a moment of prayer. And being the faith people we are, we stand up and we approach that altar with faith like this lady had saying, if I could just touch the altar, if I could just get close to the altar. And if you've never came to the altar with that kind of faith, that is the faith that you need. If I could just get somewhat close, I, 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 if I could just stand in the back, if I could just get up there, I know that I could be healed. I know that I could be released of this thing. I know that this thing would be broke off of me. And then when it does and we go back to our seats, clearly changed physically different, spiritually different, mentally different, because we serve a God who loves to heal. We serve a God who loves to make us whole. We serve a God who is a good, good father and a good father cares about us. So when we go back physically changed, we tend to do what this lady did in this story. Just touch Jesus and then fall back into society. Touch Jesus, get healed of that thing, and just get back into life. Just get back into our groove. So when we go into our workplaces, when we go into our schools, and when we go into our homes, and people see us physically different, because even if they're far from God, even if they don't believe in God, they can't deny the power that God has to physically change us. They might be able to make an excuse about it, but they can't deny it. But many of us don't share our miracle. Many of us don't share the things that uh, God does in our lives because we're worried about what that person would think about us. Of course they're going to think you're crazy. You were just physically healed of that thing that you talked about each and every day. 
So when you go in there and you're physically changed and you walk past that person's office and they see that you're no longer burdened by that pain, they see that you're no longer anxious or you're no longer depressed, you begin to plant that seed. And the Bible says that we plant the seed and we water the seed, but God makes it grow. So as they see you physically different, they see you changed. That seed begins to grow and it's as if Jesus is standing in our workplaces or our homes screaming, who touched me? Who touched me? And he's not saying it out of rebuke. He's saying it, hey, tell that person what I did for you. Tell that person how I healed you. Tell that person who physically sees you different how you were different. And then when you begin to tell them and you're like, man, this person's going to think I'm crazy. Yeah, they're going to think you're crazy, but they're going to see that you're healed. Yeah, they're going to see that you're crazy or think that you're crazy. They're probably going to see you're crazy a little bit too. But they're going to think that you're crazy, but they're going to see that you're no longer depressed. They might think that you're crazy, but they're going to see that you're no longer anxious. You might go home and your kids, man, you're crazy going to that place. You're crazy going to that church, but you come home and you're now you're full of joy. Now you're excited. Now you're doing things. Now you're up and you're moving about. You're no longer hurting by depression. And they see that. And now they're coming out of their rooms and they're like, man, there is something different about you. And it's a little crazy, but I want the crazy in my life. I want some of that crazy. Amen. I want some of that crazy. Where did you get that crazy? And you can tell people at work, man, I got it at River City Church. And it belongs to you. And you can go in there and that thing that, is, that thing that is trying to beat you down, that thing that is trying to destroy your family, that thing that is trying to make you sick, that thing that is trying to make you think that nobody likes you, you can bring it. And if you would just approach that altar and think that if you just touched, you would be healed, that God would do a mighty work in their life. And then you can sit back and you can think, I planted that seed. God used me in that way. God changed that person through me. God worked through me. And it was all because you shared your miracle. Come on, we're called as Christians, we're called as people of faith to share the things that God does in our lives. Too many times in life that we want to hold it. We want to keep it to ourselves. Miracles are too big to keep to ourselves. Miracles belong to everybody. And there is somebody in your life. There is somebody in your life desperately needing to hear the miracle. Needing to hear your testimony. Needing to hear what God did in your life. If you're sitting there thinking, man, I don't have the words to say to somebody to bring them to church. I don't have the words to say to bring somebody to Christ. God has done a mighty work in your life already, and that is exactly what you need to tell those people. It's easy to tell a story about yourself. Come on, we love ourselves. It's easy to tell a story. So you begin to tell that story about yourself and how God changed you and how God did this in your life and how God healed you and how God healed that person. Man, I went to church service and I seen this guy that had stage four cancer and he was healed of everything. And when you go to work and you tell those people that, they want that. They might not show it at first, but deep down, they want that. So draw near to God. Begin to share your miracles with everybody that you find. Even if they think you're a little bit crazy, come on, there's too many people that don't know who Jesus is because we are afraid to tell them about what he did in our lives because somebody might think that we were a little crazy. Well, I want crazy in my life. I want people to think I'm crazy. There's a lot of people that think I'm crazy. A lot of my family think that I'm crazy, but it's all right. There's a lot of us that have family that don't know who Jesus is, and we're even worried about our families looking at us that um, we might be a little crazy. But if we could just get a little bit of that crazy into their life, they would be changed people. They would be a changed generation. If we could just show these young people what it truly meant to follow God and what it truly meant to share our miracles no matter who we were talking to, it would begin to give them a renewing of faith. It would begin to give them a boldness because they are the next generation. They are the group that is going to teach the group behind them. They are the group that's going to teach the group that, that is coming up so close to them that are in back there in kids right now. And we have to put those good Christian values in them, and it's sharing exactly what God did in our lives. Amen. 
Uh, I would like to pray for you guys. If everybody could just stand up right now and bow their heads. Father God, Lord, I thank you for the miracles that you've done in our lives already, Father God. Lord, I thank you for the miracles that you will do in our lives, the miracles that you have yet to do in our lives, Father. Lord, we just pray for your signs and your wonders, and God, just give us that supernatural boldness that Pastor Brian has been praying about, Father, that supernatural boldness to approach those people in our offices, in our homes, in our schools, that we would have the boldness to approach them and tell them what you have done in our lives, Father God. Lord, we plant the seed, Father, and we water the seed. We just ask that you would allow it to grow, Father God, that you would begin to put fertilizer on that seed and you would cause it to grow, Father. Lord, of those people around us, God, thank you so much for what you're doing in this church and around this church and in this community, Father God. Lord, we just ask that you continue to bless it. Lord, make us a landmark of salvation. Continue to allow these doors to be open, Father God, that people would come in here and they would find out exactly who you are and give us the faith that this lady had, Father, that if we would just touch your robe, we would be healed, Father God. Lord, we thank you for who you are and what you do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You guys give him a big hand clap tonight. Thank you, John Tatum.